Very good evening to you. Welcome to Primetime News, coming to you live and direct from the News First Studios here in Colombo. I'm Bernadine Chai Singha. And I'm Krishan Devasagayam. We've got an interesting lineup of stories tonight, but first, a look at the headlines. Speaker signs local government election bill. Election to be held in December or January. Who is obstructing the National Audit Bill? A revelation by the Auditor General. Minister Amaravira says time has come to take a firm decision against SLF peers promoting other parties. Hidden fraud behind Southern Expressway. President Majapal Sirisena announced the National Economic Council, which he appointed, will convene on the 12th of September. The President made this statement while addressing an event in particular today. The Agricultural Services Training Centre in Karadiyanaru in Batikalo was declared open today. Thereafter, the President inspected the training centre and launched its website. I will be declaring the first week of October as a National Agrarian Week. During this week, agricultural programs will be in place across the entire country. At the Cabinet meeting, I will take a decision following discussions with the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of Ministers that all ministries should take part in this agricultural program. We cannot always import rice. It is absolutely essential that the domestic agriculture sector is further strengthened, which is why the government decided to establish a National Economic Council last week. The council will convene for the first time on the 12th of next month. The Asian Development Bank and the World Bank have agreed to grant financial provisions for this program. So I believe that we can make this program a success. Yesterday, the visiting Acting Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asian Affairs, Alice Wells, called on President Maitri Pala Sirisena. Wells praised the progress made by Sri Lanka under the leadership of President Maitri Pala Sirisena in the democratic reforms and reconciliation process. She said the U.S. highly appreciates the ambitious reforms agenda and historic steps towards reconciliation boldly undertaken by President Sirisena and will continue to extend its fullest support to Sri Lanka's development process and reconciliation. The Acting Assistant Secretary of State added that Sri Lanka has been listed for assistance under the U.S. government foreign aid agency Millennium Challenge Corporation in the near future. The second Indian Ocean Conference was inaugurated in Colombo this evening. The conference is being hosted by the National Institute of Fundamental Studies in collaboration with the India Foundation and the Rajaratnam School of International Studies. But most of all, for the Indian Ocean economic revival to be sustainable, the waters must not only be better connected, but they should remain free from non traditional and traditional threats that could impede the seamless movement of goods, people and ideas. Security is fundamental to the Sagar vision. It is essential that the waters remain peaceful, stable and secure. It is imperative too that all stakeholders abide by a rules-based global order. The Indian Ocean is prone to non-traditional security threats like piracy, smuggling, maritime terrorism, illegal fishing and trafficking of humans and narcotics. We realize that to effectively combat transnational security challenges across the Indian Ocean, including those posed by non-state actors, it is important to develop a security architecture that strengthens the culture of cooperation. In addition to the Indian External Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sushma Swaraj, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe also addressed the event. Let me refer to Sri Lanka's decision to develop its major seaports, especially the Hambantota port, which some claim to be a military base. I state clearly that Sri Lankan government headed by President Maitripala Sirisena, does not enter into military alliances with any country or make our bases available to foreign countries. We will continue military cooperation such as training, supply of equipment and taking part in joint exercises with friendly countries. Only the Sri Lankan armed forces have the responsibility 
for military activities in our ports and air force. Sri Lanka's development as a shipping, air and business hub, together with the BAV trade agreements, will contribute to the development of intra-regional trade. The economic growth in our region can only be accelerated by increasing intra-regional trade and infrastructure development, thereby strengthening connectivity. Therefore, let me reaffirm that Sri Lanka is open to trade with all our partners. We aim to become, as in the past, a destination of choice for all those looking to tap into the potential of the Indian Ocean. We intend to take a leading role in initiating a legal order in the Indian Ocean to ensure freedom of navigation. It is our belief that we all work, if we all work for these common objectives, sustainable peace and prosperity in our region can undoubtedly be achieved. The present government came into power on a number of promises of which one was to make the government audit service more transparent, productive and efficient. Clauses for an audit commission were included into the 19th amendment to the constitution at the end of the 100 days of this government. However, the National Audit Bill which empowers this commission to carry out its activities is yet to see the light of day. What is the cause for this delay? Who is causing it? The Auditor General spoke exclusively to News First on this. The President's office is vested with the responsibility of establishing commissions and facilitating them. We are of the stance that it rather happens that way. The Cabinet of Ministers has decided to hand over the task of gazetting this and preparing the act to the Secretary to the Prime Minister. There were a number of recommendations from the Finance Minister regarding this as well. After those recommendations, the activities of the Act and the free flow of the Act were completely changed. This happened through the former Finance Minister. A majority of amendments happened as a result of the recommendations that he provided. With the amendments, the Act that we made according to international legal standards just collapsed. Therefore, we removed ourselves from this without interfering since there was no meaning of us doing so. We were once again at a position where the independent role of the Auditor General could not be carried out as per the international standards. The state sector officials were afraid. In truth, the public administration officials, I am not speaking about everyone, I am speaking of a small but powerful group. They are able to influence the effect of it. We are able to understand that these changes happened as a result. I have with me the minutes of their annual general meeting that was held recently. It says that the Auditor General being able to investigate under the Audit Act, raise charges and impose punishments is a serious situation and that the Union should oppose it. The members of the Union have been completely deceived. 95% of the Public Administration Service want this Act. If this Act comes into power, they can object to any intervention saying that they are personally liable for anything that happens. All of them know this. The people who have been accused of wrongdoings, they look at this act in this angle. <laughs> that is the real reason. The others are not reasons that they have to consider. If they make a decision without carrying out their responsibilities properly and if that decision causes a loss, that should be given back to the government. How will the government's function if not? Yesterday, however, President Maitre said expressed his regret over the delay in the National Audit Bill. <laughs> I said in Parliament that the audit bill would be tabled by January this year. It has been eight months since then. I am sad that we have not been able to get this passed. There are many delays. We have spoken about it on numerous occasions in the Cabinet as well. We want to bring in this bill as fast as possible. I believe that the processors have been expedited. Therefore, I believe that this issue will be resolved soon. In a media briefing was held in Colombo today on the 66th anniversary of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, which is set to be held this Sunday at the Campbell Park in Boralla. <laughs> At the anniversary meeting, we intend to speak on the issues and aspirations of the people. Our proposals are being drafted accordingly. If you do not highlight President Maitripala Sirisena's anti-corruption drive, it would be the same groups which will be at the forefront in the future as well. 
If this is not done, supporters will campaign and rally with these politicians chanting, Our thief is good for us. We will not remain idle after the anniversary. We will start restructuring the party from the very next week. If anyone has not received an invitation, I make an open invitation to everyone right now before you to attend the anniversary. Even I did not receive an invitation as yet. We do not get invitations like that. Neither does the president. The picture of the advice of your party has been put up at other parties. Moreover, SLFP members attend meeting of those parties. What is the decision on those people? Every time members of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party meet, they ask what is this nonsense they are doing and why aren't these people being suspended from the party? I will tell you why. Even I am responsible for this. President Maitri Palasirisena also takes the responsibility for not removing them because we are constantly trying to unite the party even more rather than breaking it apart. But now I think this is nearing its last straw. It appears that it has crossed the line. It has come to a point where we are under pressure from the grassroots level of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. Will the local government elections be postponed yet again? According to the chairman of the Elections Commission, the election could be held on the 9th of December or the first week of January next year. However, yet again, there appears to be a few more changes needed to the bill. The Local Authorities Elections Amendment Bill, which was passed in Parliament last week, was signed by the Speaker today. After this bill is signed, the preferential scuffle will be abolished in this country's future local government elections. At this moment, we are seeing our dream to create a clean political system in the country. We hope that such an election system and a political culture will be created to appoint suitable public representatives. According to the bill signed by the Speaker today, a proposal was submitted to the Cabinet on Tuesday to change the composition of electing members for local government bodies. According to this proposal, amendments have been made to the Municipal Council's Ordinance, Urban Council's Ordinance and the Pradesh Sabha's Act. Cabinet. It has been proposed in Cabinet to bring in three new acts, thuggery, dishonesty and cunningness. Select the most suitable word from here to define this and underline it. The government is trying to evade the election. This is just another landmark in their dishonest journey. The Urban Council and Municipal Council Ordinances and the Pradesh Sabha's Act require a minor amendment. The percentage in the divisions were increased from 30% to 40%. This received Cabinet approval and we intend on tabling it in Parliament in the near future. But I must state with responsibility that this is definitely not a cause to delay the election. This election will not be postponed whatsoever. I have fulfilled my duty. It is the Elections Commission which holds the election. The draft bill passed by the Cabinet of Ministers must be gazetted. After issuing a gazette notification, it can be included into the parliamentary order paper within 14 days. Anyone who wants to go to courts against it has a week to do so. But I believe that there is no reason as such for anyone to do so. This bill can definitely be passed before the end of September. There are no plans to issue election notices until the end of September anyway because the 2017 voters list is only certified on the 30th of September. The election will be held in 60 days after nominations are called. If so, the date to hold the election will be the 9th of December, which is a Saturday. Since we have not seen the bill as yet, there is an issue concerning the number of days needed for the initial activities. We are trying our best to hold the election on the 9th of December. But if we cannot, the 6th and the 13th of January are the alternative dates. The election will have to be held on one of these three dates. Revelations on evidence tampering were exposed at the Presidential Commission of Inquiry today through the evidence of Sachit Devatantri from Perpetual Treasuries. The AGES Department claimed he is a whistleblower under the Protection of Victims of Crime and Witnesses Act and if anyone at PTL attempts to influence him and if PTL attempts to change the nature of his employment, it will be deemed a criminal offence. Special credit must be given to the detectives from the Criminal Investigations Department and the officers from the Attorney General's Department for making this breakthrough. Zulfik Farzan reports on Bondgate.
The senior IT executive at Perpetual Treasuries, Sachit Devathantwe, testifying before the commission, said that when they obtained the extend voice level call recording system from Metropolitan Communications Private Limited, their requirement was communicated to Metropolitan Communications and this requirement was communicated to him by Kasun Palisena that when he attempted to back up data of this voice logger system at P uh, Perpetual Treasuries Limited, he encountered an error. However, he had not communicated this error to Metropolitan Communications Private Limited. He had resorted to a separate measure. What he had done was copy the wave files of the call recordings into a flash drive and then from the flash drive move those wave files into a DVD. He said he did this measure of backup of his uh, understanding uh, twice or twice a week and in one DVD you could store up to six or seven months of call recordings in the wave format. Sachit Devathanthi went on to note that the DVDs containing these wave files of the calls recordings were given to his uh, senior officer at Perpetual Treasuries, Nuan Salgado. On the 5th of July this year, Nuan Salgado had approached Sachit Deva Tantwi next to the uh, server room at Perpetual Treasuries Limited and handed him a small document with, which contained serial numbers and Salgado had instructed Sachit that these serial number calls need to be deleted from the extent voice logger system. Sachit Devathanthi, however, had noted that if you delete these serial numbers, there will be a gap in the numerical order of the serial numbers of that specific date and had suggested that they copy other serial numbers from other dates and paste it onto this particular date from where they will be deleting the serial numbers and Nuan Salgado had given his consent to go ahead with this measure. Now, additional Solicitor General Dapula G. Libera informed the Commission this is destruction of evidence and it is a serious offence and the Inspector General of Police must be informed by the Presidential Commission of Inquiry so that the Criminal Investigations Department can conduct a criminal investigation into this matter. It was very clear that Perpetual Treasuries Limited and the people at Perpetual Treasuries Limited had attempted to subvert the course of justice, citing the fabrication of evidence that has been done. The additional Solicitor General Dapula Jilivewa called for the immediate arrest of this individual known as Nuan Salgado. The Commission said that given the legal provisions and the witness testimony of Sachit Devathantri, the Attorney General's attention had been or will be drawn towards this matter and the Attorney General can take the appropriate action. Last evening, after Sachit Devathantri gave his statement to the Criminal Investigation Department detectives assisting this commission, uh, he had given a piece of paper that he had pulled out from his wallet to inspectors of the CID, Ishan Rabin and Nalin Hewat. Now this piece of paper, a very small piece of paper, had contained the serial numbers that were given to him by Nuan Salgado to be deleted from the system. And this morning, Sachit Devathantri again had handed over torn pieces of paper to the Criminal Investigations Department and after the CID officers had managed to uh, fix the pieces of these documents, they had uncovered that this too was a list that was given to Sachit Devathantri by Nuan Salgado to be deleted from the voice logger system. On the 6th of July, when Sachit Devathantri had visited the server room at Perpetual Treasury Limited, he had found out that the voice logger system computer given by Metropolitan Communications Limited was not working properly. He had not informed Metropolitan Communications Private Limited on this matter and he had tried to rectify the issue in that computer. However, he had failed and thereafter he had made an attempt to use another computer and install the software of the voice logger system into that computer. He had informed Nuan Salgado about it and thereafter the data files and the wave files 
uh, which were already altered by them had been moved from the original computer given by Metropolitan Communications into the new computer of Perpetual Treasuries Limited. When the Presidential Commission of Inquiry instructed that they need the data of the call information, that is when the fabricated material had been given to the Presidential Commission of Inquiry. Now this entire issue came out when the Attorney General's Department informed the Commission that from the calls that were given to them by Perpetual Treasuries Limited, they had not been able to trace the calls that finalized the deals of the first sale of bonds to the EPF which were purchased by Perpetual Treasuries Limited at the 27th February 2015 auction. The chairman of the Road Development Authority made a clarification today on JVP MP Sanun Handunethi's allegation over the Southern Expressway extension project. The chairman of the Road Development Authority in a letter denied any corruption or fraud in the Southern Expressway extension project as alleged by MP Sunil Handunethi. The letter says that the Road Development Authority has not issued a directive as alleged by MP Handunethi to import a super luxury vehicle without tax. According to the clarification sent by the chairman of the RDA, changes to the Southern Expressway extension project had to be introduced based on the findings of geological and environmental research. The letter says part of the highway which was earlier proposed to be constructed after a landfill had to be elevated on pillars to minimize geological and environmental hazards such as floods and other natural disasters. The chairman of the RDA has expressed regret that MP Sunil Handunethi as a chairman of COPE had divulged information to the media without a clarification from his office. Plans for the third phase of the out circular highway were amended in a bid to save money. This was done through shortening bridges and reducing lanes on the expressway. However, after defrauding this money, the government has taken further steps to defraud money through phase one of the Southern Expressway extension program. This 30-kilometre stretch of road extends from Guragama Mathura to Beliatta. Through this letter, the Prime Minister's office informs the Secretary to the Ministry of Highways on the 13th of November 2016 regarding a decision taken by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Management or CCEM. The decision made by the CCEM was to extend the distance of the expressway which was to run on bridges from kilometer 6.33 to kilometer 9.11. This 2.78 kilometer stretch was added by the CCEM disregarding technical reports. This decision was made by the CCEM on the 9th of November 2016. However, there was no technical report to justify this decision by this time. The one and only document which calls for such an extension is this letter sent by the chief engineer of the Chinese construction firm to the project director. The letter was dated the 30th of November 2016. So that means the CCEM made the remarkable technical decision to extend the distance on bridges 21 days before the engineers in charge of building this expressway realized the necessity of this. A question arises whether there are civil engineers who can foresee the future on this CCEM. The most severe issue is that the Chinese company had only opposed an extension of 1.215 kilometers, whereas the CCEM divined and approved a distance of 2.78 kilometers. Based on the extension of 1.215 kilometers, the forecasted estimate for the project rises to over 126 billion rupees. Although the public is still unaware of how much the project will cost because of the decision by the CCEM to extend the distance on bridges to 2.78 kilometers, the so-called economic experts are Paskar Lingam and Charita Ratvata of the CCEM are probably fully aware of this cost. This letter by the project director of the RDA sent on the 26th of November 2016 to the Chinese firm stating that the project should not exceed the monetary value of the loan granted for this project becomes a joke because it is still uncertain how much money has been approved from China for this project as a loan. What would most likely occur is that the loan amount would be finalized once the construction is completed. Such development schemes may be mere ploys for gathering funds for the next election. In a backdrop where revenue sources such as fraudulent bond scams dried up, 
or the CCEM taking arbitrary decisions on behalf of the nation. Minister of Finance and Mass Media, this is over to you. A tender that, has an, that was annulled rather, has been revived in spite of a cancellation by the president. News First's Roshan Chamika and Farah Shakotali have the details. We have exposed a very big kind of a, uh, highway or expressway related uh, corruption yesterday as well. But today the senior journalist Mr. Faraz Shaukatali has more to expose. Faraz, what is this newest uh, exposure? Uh, several months ago, uh, the, the government, uh, the Prime Minister actually signed off uh, on, a, on a cabinet memo. And um, basically it was so that they, they agreed to get a bank loan through a Japanese bank for a billion dollars, one billion dollars. And they called for a, a process. They made it out that this was a government-to-government -government uh, uh, facility, but it's actually not so. Uh, it's a Can you please uh, explain? This particular loan was taken for what? What's the purpose? Ostensibly to fund the section 3 of the central expressway okay uh, that is 32.5 kilometers okay now in the first process they managed to ensure that this was a uh, open only to japanese companies mm -hmm. and they they roped in the uh, the embassy of japan and uh, the rda chairman wrote to the ambassador and asked to be recommended some names and using the services of a local chamber uh, the embassy did provide three names mm -hmm. now they used this as as though it was a, an internationally funded uh, project where the gov government of japan is funding this but it's not it's a commercial loan mm -hmm. with commercial rate I, if it's if it's a government of Japan uh, facility, then they the usual form is it's limited to Japanese companies. Usually, Japanese are considered very clean nation. Indeed, so there's not. Why, 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 why you why you are why you are raising this uh, question? Like uh, why now you bring this matter into this table, saying under the label of a corruption? Well, it's like this: three companies participated in the initial bid. Okay, two companies didn't even submit a bid. There's only one company submitted Just one co company submitted it, but they didn't supply the bid security, the okay. bid bond. So even they so will not qualify? No, that's right. And so the project committee and the cabinet appointed negotiating committee, the CANC, rejected and annulled the entire uh, process Okay. because obviously nobody was fully compliant then why was this uh, suspicion uh, point uh, came up thereafter now we have a situation where that first call was annulled okay they then introduced another company fourth company a fourth company also japanese okay was it was it recommended by the embassy again uh, no it's no it wasn't who chose it uh, well th that is uh, a little bit um, hazy okay it's a bit gray we don't know all right but they then had another they called it round two mm -hmm. but you can't have round two when you annul one tender you must call for another okay there that wouldn't be a round two yes that's what the national procurement guidelines say okay you well, how can you have round two when round one was annulled okay right so you, you need to have a new process in this second round they had two bids one from the original company that didn't supply the bid bond and another that was the new company. Mm -hmm. However, the project committee and the CANC rejected the offer and the bid made by the second company mm -hmm. on the grounds that they did not have the expertise or the experience in key areas like still 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 the still the negotiation is to select a company now that's right. how, how come there would be a corruption how does money get involved well in this I sh I'll explain that to you what they did was they the the, the, the project committee and the CNC cancelled the the bid they rejected the bid of the second company mm -hmm. 
it was then left to just the one company. This okay. time round, they did manage to give the bid bond, okay. the bid security. Now then, were they were they pre a preferred company before? Well, they have a long history of involvement in Sri Lanka. They are also represented in Sri Lanka uh, by uh, f by a businessman who is known as a private banker, a, a, a secretive businessman who is under investigation for on money laundering and all sorts of so other that charges. means a big wig who's connected to the previous governments as well he, a big wig who's can been connected to a number of uh, governments not okay. just this government or the previous one okay. what's, what's, what, 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 what's the total loan amount that they are talking about they the, to, the amount their initial bid was for 159 billion rupees 159 billion yes okay. however the cabinet appointed negotiating committee did their job mm -hmm. and they negotiated with them and settled at a price at just under 135 billion it's 134 billion 904 million rupees you tell me this part what's the cost per kilometer in u.s dollar millions approximately and i hope you're seated well because it's 26 million dollars per kilometer 26 million dollars that's right so they were talking about 12 or 10 billion dollars US million, dollars, million dollars million dollars when they were talking about the corruption in the southern highway that's correct this is more than double of that amount that's right that's right indeed at that time that government said it was difficult terrain yes and i'm sure the central expressway is also difficult terrain so what's the, what's the does president aware of this situation well that's a good point we have a letter we have a copy of a letter dated may of this year in which the president cancels this saying that it is not in keeping with national procurement guidelines okay so the president is aware he's aware because he cancelled it who has put the cabinet paper mm, uh, the minister of charge of highways mr lakshman kiriana okay then the loan uh, the request for, for the loan <coughs> was signed by the prime minister that's right it was okayed initially by the prime minister 26 million dollars per kilometer that's a huge increase compared to the other all the other highways yes uh, i mean we, we know we you have to look at it but the complaint was that 12 million dollars a kilometer was too much at that time and now it's 26 million dollars unfortunately the bond scam bond gate was exposed okay mainly by this network and any monies that were able to be made from the bond gate from bond gate appears to be on hold okay thanks to the commission yes so they need to find the money from somewhere and i believe that these projects the road projects in this particular section three okay is such an opportunity so that means as general public you and i have to pay for their sins that's the way it looks like facet sri lanka 2017 the 27th international gem and jewelry show commence at the city mao banda naik international memorial hall today the exhibition will be here till the 3rd of september <laughs> Several ministers and public representatives, great big connection with industry and politicians. Everybody has a Desia Archi who has a manic mal, and you know, this is now an industry that even touches politicians. But to be more serious, Sri Lanka, after so many years of being in the industry, has a 500 million dollar export. I don't think that's sufficient. There are many issues that. The industry needs uh, that has to be addressed by the government. This has to be liberalized more. One of the issues is that tax, ex tax exemption to the general industry has been always available. It should be given because the revenues are all foreign earnings. We also have a major issue with the National Gem and Jewelry Authority. I believe that we need less controls and uh, less bureaucratic involvement. I think the National Gem and Jewelry Authority has to be revamped. It has to have a different identity as a different regulatory role to help the industry to be able to work itself more freely. Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe was the chief guest of the event. I see gems and jewelry as a major source of foreign exchange earnings. It just can't be 500 million dollars. We have looked at this. Sri Lanka is well known for its gems. 
but we must also now become even better known for our duet. We have to develop our gaming industry, but we must also realize there are environmental concerns. Secondly, that there are far more gems now being produced outside Sri Lanka which comes into Sri Lanka. Many of our traders now travel out to bring gems into Sri Lanka. And the main centers today for the gem trade, even in Asia ones, which are not in any way connected to the mining of gems. Sri Lanka also has those prospects. And we must decide how we are going to develop. For me, the criteria for development is trebling the foreign exchange journey, ensuring more people are employed, and also ensuring that the government revenue is not in any way damaged. The seminar on Blue Economy, Prospects and Challenges for Sri Lanka, organized by the Bandaranaika Center for International Studies, was held in Colombo today. The keynote speech of the seminar, which was held in two sessions, was delivered by High Commissioner of Australia to Sri Lanka, Bryce Hutchison. Um, the volume of sea traffic in the Indian Ocean is expected to expand considerably in, in years to come. It has been expanding. Uh, uh, we're seeing, for instance, gro growing global trade in coal, bauxite, LNG, uh, which could form part of Sri Lanka's um, uh, growth story in years to come as well. This increase in this particular trade will have implications not just for economic development, but also uh, will have geopolitical resonance, will have implications for energy security. Fisheries. That's an obvious one for a country such as Sri Lanka. Uh, offers significant opportunities to meet growing food security challenges. The seminar highlighted the potential of blue economy and strategic perspectives of blue economy in Sri Lanka. UPFA parliamentarian Garmini Lukuge expressed the following views at a media briefing convened by the joint opposition in Colombo today. Whenever Ranil Vikramasinghe gets on the street, he says the country has developed, but it is under him that all of these thefts have taken place. I got to know that the governor of the central bank had told COPE he did everything with the approval of the prime minister. All of this will come out soon. When such allegations are raised, the government has a duty to suspend the activities of those companies, their investments and their bank accounts. But none of that has been done. Money is being used freely to pay those who put footnotes. With that, we wrap up Primetime News. I'm Bernadine Jai Singha. And I'm Krishan Devasagam. It was a pleasure having you with us. Take care and good night.